an unimaginable loss in the United States. More than 250,000 Americans have now lost their lives to COVID-19. Hello, I'm Arnand Naidu, and this is The Heat. With coronavirus cases surging across the United States, the U.S. Centers for Disease Control and Prevention are now recommending all Americans not to travel on Thanksgiving holiday. As of Wednesday, the country surpassed more than 162,000 infections with nearly 80,000 people in the hospital. North Dakota's governor asked nurses and doctors to keep working even if they become sick because of staffing shortages. The situation is so dire that in El Paso, Texas, that prisoners have been brought in to help move bodies to mobile morgues. And some hospitals are so overrun, patients are being airlifted to other cities in the state. During a briefing by the White House, Coronavirus Task Force uh, Dr. Deborah Burks said Americans need to be more vigilant about wearing masks inside. Behind this level of community spread is a lot of asymptomatic cases. People are spreading the virus because they don't know they are infected with the virus. And so people are coming together indoors, everyone looks healthy, but among those individuals could be individuals that already are infected, have no symptoms, and are unknowingly spreading the virus to others. Well, for more now on the pandemic, let's bring in our panel. Joining us from Seoul is Dr. Jerome Kim. He's the Director General of the International Vaccine Institute. Here in Washington, D.C., Joseph Williams is the senior news editor with U.S. News and World Report. From California, Andrew Neumer is an associate professor of population, health and disease prevention, public health at the University of California, Irvine. And from Boston, Dr. Yanir Bayam is president of the New England Complex Systems Institute and the co-founder of the COVID Action Group. Thank you to all of you for being with us. Dr. Yanir Bayam, let me start with you. We just heard those Frightening figures there. 250,000 Americans have now lost their lives to COVID-19. On Wednesday alone, 1,900 people died, according to figures provided by the Johns Hopkins University. What kind of pressure are these numbers putting on the American healthcare infrastructure system? Is it coping? And the answer is, of course, not. We just heard that there are uh, overflowing hospitals. Uh, and it's surely not just overflowing hospitals, but the staff is inadequate for the uh, treatments and people are uh, not getting the treatment that they need. Um, and that, of course, means that the, the seriousness and even the deaths will increase very rapidly. Um, but really, um, I think we should uh, reevaluate our measures of success and and the challenges that we're facing because all of these deaths and all of the disease is should be understood as being preventable and so to talk about the fact that we are at this point overflowing the hospitals is maybe now a trigger for action uh, but we really need to have a very different goal and to set a goal of uh, really cutting drastically the transmission um, and, and eventually having a goal of elimination of the virus from the country. Dr. Boyan, when you say uh, a lot of this was preventable, uh, what wasn't done? So we did lockdowns, but we didn't combine them with effective isolation, with effective contact tracing. Somehow people had this idea that if we do the quote lockdown, whatever that means, that uh, we will be able to do the best that we can. Um, and the true answer is that a lockdown is a part of a strategy. And the strategy includes also how to get out of the lockdown. And the most important part of that strategy is what we call a green zone strategy, which is if you decrease the number of cases significantly, then many parts of the country are without transmission in the community. And so you protect those areas using limitations on non-essential travel, and then you expand those areas to cover the country. And, and this has been demonstrated effectively in many countries uh, recently in Australia that has 
um, uh, eliminated the disease from multiple states. And even when there are outbreaks that happen, it, they can be taken care of very quickly. There's a firefighting strategy, right? It's you want to get rid of the fire, and then where it pops up, then you aggressively attack it and get rid of it in as short a time as possible. And the tremendous advantage of this, as opposed to the strategy that we've been using, is that we can actually open up rapidly, economically, in a normal way, so that health uh, effects are tremendous, because we don't have people getting sick and in hospitals and dying and having the long-term effects of the disease, the long COVID effect. But also, the economy can return to normal. And today, we're looking at the situation in Australia and New Zealand and Taiwan and China and seeing that they have restored normal economic activity, perhaps with the exception of a few small areas for a short period of time when there is a new small outbreak. But overall, the economies are functioning and the people are engaging in social activities and in sports events uh, almost or very close to what we had a year ago before the virus came here at all. Andrew Neumann, we have seen this surge in cases uh, uh, over the past few weeks. Uh, it is not totally unexpected because we were told that there would be a surge with the onset of winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. But if we look at the United States, in every state infections are rising. Only in Hawaii has there been a decrease of 10%. Um, what is your view on why we are seeing these surges at this time? We're seeing the surges uh, at this time because we predicted, as, as you said in the question, that in the, in the fall and winter, we'll see surges. These respiratory viral diseases are seasonal with a winter dominance. All of them are. Influenza, RSV, measles, the coronaviruses that cause the common cold, the rhinoviruses that cause the common cold, et cetera. These viral respiratory diseases are all seasonal with the winter dominance. And experts warned all summer long that we would see rises in the fall and, and that the, the summer little wa mini waves that we were seeing were simply uh, a byproduct of the, the fact that this is a newly emerging virus, that it, it breaks trend in its first year because uh, it's brand new and we get these little summer waves. But uh, infectious disease experts have been warning for months that we were going to see fall waves. There are changes in humidity that help the spread of the droplets that the virus spreads with. There are changes in human activity, including schools, but not only schools. And, uh, and the fact of the matter is we don't fully understand you know, you know, the exact recipe by which these viruses are all winter dominant, but we know from decades of experience studying them closely that they, that they are winter dominant. And so we definitely have a, a, a tough uh, road to hoe um, to get back to where we were in late summer. And, uh, and we're not alone in this respect. I mean, uh, Yanir talked about some of the amazing success stories, and, uh, and we should try to emulate those to the extent to which we can. But Europe is also facing uh, very tough uh, statistics right now. So right. let me enter a little bit. Thank you for laying that out. But I do think that the seasonality is not the primary story here. It may play a role, but what we see in many countries is that there is simply a consistent exponential growth since the opening up of economies and social activity in the summer. So it seems that the primary driver is just the human behavioral activity, that we know that the disease transmits uh, by, you know, it, it, it's a respiratory disease, it transmits through the air. And as long as we were in the lockdowns, we at least weren't growing in cases. But once we relaxed the restrictions, the number of cases simply increased and increased and increased. And if you fit it with a a curve that's a straight line on a multiplicative plot. So that's how we measure infection. It's just a straight line. So there's no indication that there is a seasonal difference in many places in the world 
including in many countries in Europe and in the U.S. Right. Andrew, just one other point before we move on, uh, Andrew, and that is, to what extent, as you pointed out, it's also flu season right now with the onset of winter, to what extent does that complicate the treatment of uh, people having uh, COVID-19? And, of course, there is the additional issue, which was pointed out by Dr. Deborah Birx at the beginning of our show at the White House Coronavirus Briefing, where there are so many people who are asymptomatic and don't really know they have the virus and could be spreading it that way. Well, the asymptomatic is, is, is the big is the big worry because uh, the, you know the evidence suggests very strongly that people who are either totally asymptomatic or just pre-symptomatic, uh, they haven't their symptoms haven't emerged yet can can spread the disease. And so you know it's, it's that's why we all need to mask, not just you know some of us, and that's why we all need to take precautions not just some of us. And, and that's why, you know, contact tracing uh, where appropriate, you know, is, is very important. Uh, it, it's very hard to contact trace in an exploding epidemic. It's easier to contact trace in an epidemic where, where we have, you know, cooperation from everyone in terms of masking and so on. But uh, the asymptomatic transmission aspect is, is, is a big part of why this is spreading uh, the, the way it is. Dr. Jerome Kim, uh, a lot of people are pinning their hopes on vaccines. And we had some good news over the past few weeks. We heard that vaccines are proving to be safe. The tests are telling us that. Uh, Oxford University scientists announced that the vaccine that they are producing uh, showed um, a good response, a strong immune response in older adults. What can you tell us about this? That's actually a very important demographic, since we know that the elderly are particularly susceptible to, um, to dying from uh, COVID-19 infection. So that was really important. I mean, the, the recent announcements have been really remarkable. It's two proofs of concept, actually. First, that an RNA vaccine uh, is, can protect against an infectious disease. And second, that it's possible to develop a vaccine that actually protects against uh, COVID disease manifestations. I think that the, you know, the good news is that we potentially are going to be hearing about additional vaccines, not only RNA vaccines, that protect against infection or disease and are safe at two months. So that's the, the key here. We have two months worth of data, both for efficacy and for safety. So there's still a lot of work to do. Other vaccines, such as the Pfizer vaccine, also appear to work very well in the elderly. Actually, the um, efficacy data in people over 65 was 94%, just one percentage point below the 95% that they reported yesterday. So. Um, Let's just hope that these levels of protection uh, persist for six months, 12 months, 24 months. Right. Dr. Kim, when you say two months efficacy, is that sufficient, do you think, to convince people uh, that this is safe, that it's safe to take the vaccine? Because we hear a lot of skepticism from people saying, we don't know whether this is safe. It's been rushed through. Yeah. And so, you know, I mean, I think that, the, um, that, that all the efforts that have been made have really been done to look at safety first and, and efficacy as well. Usually when you, when you start a vaccine trial, you're, you're very worried about the, you know, giving the first dose to humans. And, and typically we watch people very carefully for two weeks because the vast majority of, of the, the simple side effects occur within that early time frame. The two month period, and, and the two month period is one that the US FDA chose, I think, very carefully. By two months, the vast majority of you know, things that we're going to see like Guillain-Barre will, will occur. So they just wanted to make sure, and, and before emergency use authorization can be given, the FDA has said we need a median of two, or a, roughly the average of two months of follow-up uh, on all the volunteers in the study. Again, because that's when the, the side effects occur. We do need, however, to continue to, to watch people to one year, two years, and three years, because there could be the occurrence of very rare uh, very unusual side effects, and we need to know these. And one of the, the problems of having all these vaccines that may show efficacy, that, that is, may, may protect people against disease, is that we may be using more than one. So it's going to be very care, uh, important to be able to document what people have received so that as we follow um, safety signals, we know uh, and we can attribute those safety signals to particular vaccines. 
Joseph Williams, let's talk about the politics of all of this. Uh, regrettably, this crisis has very strong political overtones. And um, we look at the United States right now. The White House did hold a briefing uh, late this afternoon, but uh, they're becoming rarer and rarer, these briefings. We used to see them every day, but we don't see that anymore. There seems to be a vacuum in leadership right now because it's a time of transition. Uh, the projected winner of the election, Joseph Biden, says President Trump is refusing to help his transition team make the fight against COVID-19 uh, easier. It's making, they, they're not getting the kind of data that they need to formulate plans to move ahead with this. Uh, what can you tell us about these political battles and how they're impacting the fight against the, uh, the pandemic? Well, the, the political machinations are just stunning. I mean, you have a, a presidential election that, has been de that was declarative. Uh, he, it wasn't a narrow election in the Electoral College. Uh, Joseph Biden clearly won the election, but President Trump's refusal to work with him is having huge consequences. Uh, in the military, the phrase would be dereliction of duty. Uh, but ever since the election has been called in favor of Joe Biden, President Trump has all but disappeared. He's, had, he's held a briefing here and there. He's had an announcement here and there. But at a time where we need national leadership, the president is nowhere to be found. And in further complicating the situation is he's uh, banned all of his staff from talking to President-elect Biden, the incoming administration, to get them uh, ready so they could hit the ground running. And so uh, that ban, coupled with the president's, uh, and there's not really any other way to describe it, uh, it's almost selfish behavior uh, that he is trying to prove that the election was not a legitimate one. Uh, it's costing people's lives. Uh, sure, we have a, vac a vaccination a vaccine on the horizon, but there's all kinds of considerations that need to go into distributing it, logistics, who gets it, who gets at the front of the line, how it's distributed. So even though we have hope on the horizon, it's still a good two or three months away. And while we're waiting for that to, to, to occur, we still have a death rate that's spiking. We're almost at 2,000 deaths per day a quarter of a million Americans dead. Uh, so in any context, this is not good news for anyone other than uh, President Trump, who himself caught the virus and seems not to have really grasped the fact that this is very serious business that needs his attention. Uh, Dr. Yanir Bayam, uh, there is another complication which might be unique to the United States in that these are 50 states that we're talking about here. Each state seems to be formulating its own response to the pandemic. There doesn't seem to be a national plan yet that everybody would be willing to follow. Uh, how does that make the situation worse? Uh, sure, it's really important for there to be collaboration, but Australia also has multiple states, each of which has their own plan and and is executing, but they talk to each other, right? And and in the United States, people can and do talk to each other, multiple states talk to each other, and it is possible for them to form shared plans and to aggressively take on the challenge. I think the real problem is simply one of, uh, two, maybe two parts. One is setting the goal. There's a lot of confusion about what the goal should be. And if you understand that the goal should be elimination of the virus as, as far as we can, as close to that as we can, then what you realize is that um, you then address the execution of that plan. And once you're involved in the execution of that plan, you can get people together and to collaborate. But as, until you have a, a goal, and this is something that uh, really should be understood not just in government, but in business and by the public, that it's clarity about the goal that enables you to accomplish it. And, and that's the main thing that we're missing. Andrew, uh, many people are dealing with symptoms now. We notice, uh, you know, days and weeks after they were first expected to recover, we've got this new term going around now, long haulers, that term being used more and more often. What do we know about the long-term effects of being infected by the virus? Well, I mean, there's there's two. As I see it, there's two issues here. I mean, one is that uh, the, the the distribution has a long tail of, in terms of how how long it takes people to recover. So, for some people, it's 10 days, and for other people, it's 20 days, and for and for a smaller group of people, it's 30 days or 40. And uh, that's just a sort of a tail of a distribution. And uh, you know, it's just something that's unfortunate, but it's it's part of the the natural history of the infection. Uh, the other thing is the 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 more uh, nebulous phenomenon of covid long haulers where there's a diverse array of symptoms that are uh, seem to be persistent beyond any kind of tail but just seem to be uh you know a, a durable um 
sequela of the infection. And th those require more study, in my opinion. Um, and I think a lot of people would agree. I mean, we don't have years and years of experience dealing with this virus. We have months. And so it's too early if to I say that. Add something, yeah. If I could add yeah. something. We do have at this point, you know, eight, nine months. And sure, there's a lot more that we can learn. But we have hundreds of thousands of people that have joined support groups and are reporting their cases. And the medical institutions have recognized that uh, this long haulers or COVID, long COVID uh, is, is a phenomenon. And, and it does show up in p quite severe consequences, including heart damage and brain damage and lung damage and damage to other organs. And there does seem to be very direct damage to organs. And the biologists that analyze these say that, for example, the heart damage is not something that the heart can heal. It's, it's very likely to be a lifelong problem. And when we look at the, um, the uh, SARS, the disease that's most similar to this disease, 10 years after people have had it, people still can't work. They're disabled. Mm -hmm. uh, and this is something that we may very, we, we, we are very likely to see given the information that we have currently. Uh, Dr. Kim, talking about vaccines again, the pharmaceutical company Pfizer announced that its vaccine is 95% effective. Another company, Moderna, says its drug is 94.5% safe. Um, now, of course, they will go to the FDA for certification. What is the criteria that the FDA here in the United States will be looking at to certify these drugs safe? So I think it's really important to distinguish between uh, what the companies are applying for now, which is emergency use authorization, and what the FDA will do in the end. The FDA had preset criteria for uh, efficacy, and that was an efficacy greater than 50 percent. So these are at two months, again, significantly in excess of that. And, you know, and it's very, very positive news. What the FDA will, might grant, and what I think Pfizer will soon, if it hasn't already applied for, is permission to start using the vaccine under emergency use programs. I think, as, as some of the other speakers have said, let's just remember that this is a war. The vaccine is a very important weapon. But you need a strategy, which still is going to include masks, distancing, and hygiene. And you need to make it in significant quantity at high quality. And then you need to distribute it to the people around the world, the army that's going to fight and inoculate everybody, and, and allow the vaccine to actually do its job. So there's a tremendous amount of work in front of us. Uh, and, but I think that the, the news of, of Pfizer, Moderna, and, and hopefully other companies in the next few weeks is going to be very, very important. Right, and Dr. Kim, when you say uh, they will apply for permission and possibly get permission for emergency use of the drug, does that mean that the FDA will perhaps lower its criteria or its standard uh, when it authorizes drugs of this type? So the FDA has actually already published guidance, uh, and the guidance is very similar to, to other vaccines that the FDA licenses. So, you know, uh, so unlike countries where vaccines were approved without any evidence of safety or efficacy, the US FDA will continue to use safety and efficacy, as, as will the EMA, um, for conditional approval, perhaps, in Europe. Um, and, you know, so I think it's going to be very important to actually look at those data. And one of the reasons Pfizer didn't apply mm -hmm. as soon as it made the announcement was it didn't have adequate amounts of safety data, and the FDA required that. Joseph Williams, you know, when this uh, outbreak first started, and that was nine or ten months ago, one of the biggest issues in the United States, remember those news conferences that the White House used to hold every afternoon, uh, the big issue was uh, a shortage of tests. But even now, nine or ten months later, we're seeing, still seeing long lines of people in many, many states uh, waiting for tests. Um, is U.S. testing capacity still lagging behind? Uh, clearly it is. Anytime you have long lines waiting for people to get tested for a vaccine that's highly contagious and that those tests on that day are merely a snapshot in time, they don't predict whether or not you're going to continue to be safe for days and days or even if you don't have the virus and may be asymptomatic and those symptoms may come on later before you get the results of your test. Uh, so the testing capacity is really lagging behind. Look, uh, the, the, the problem here again is not lack of a national strategy lack of leadership. Uh, we have eyes turned to Georgia, and that may or may not settle things and may or may not get the government 
moving in one direction, but the problem here is we still have a president who is contesting an election, and 75% of his followers believe that the election was rigged, and those followers are far less likely to take any vaccine, and indeed far less likely to take precautions like wearing a mask. So until we heal this rift, or until we all come together in a unified fashion, it's going to be a struggle, and it's going to be more loss of life, and it doesn't look like that kind of, uh, of, of discord among the American people is going to, going to resolve itself anytime soon. So we're in for a long haul. We're in for more, more tragedy. It's going to be a long, dark winter with no sunlight, I think, for a while. Yanni yeah, Abaya, uh, we have been hearing from the World Health Organization on uh, these vaccines. Uh, we heard from Mike Ryan of the World Health Organization. Uh, he says that they only part of the solution, not all of the solution. Let's listen to what he had to say. Adding vaccines is going to give us a huge chance. But if we add vaccines and forget the other things, COVID does not go to zero. We need to add vaccination to the existing physical measures, <clears throat> being careful, and hygiene. And if we add that physical distancing and hygiene um, and, and care to vaccine, I think we will go a long way to getting rid of this virus. So, Dr. Boyan, this is something that needs clarity because there is a view, which I have heard from many places, uh, which is that once we take the vaccine, everything's going to be fine. We go back to life as normal. Yeah, everybody would like, you know, this magic pill that we take and then we're done. And, and you know, we have a flu vaccine and we still don't have, haven't gotten rid of the flu. It comes back every year. And, and, and so thinking about a vaccine as a, as a solution to the problem is not a good idea. And... And, and the other thing that we have to remember is that it will take time. As we were just told, there's a lot of logistics and, and, and the time frame of this is, is surely not immediate. Having the approval for the vaccine is not having, you know, millions and millions and millions of, of vaccines that are actually given. So there's a, a long time and this disease is killing 2,000, almost 2,000 people per day. Uh, we can't wait. So that we really do need to think about it as right. part of the strategy. If we get the number of cases down quite low, then the vaccine helps in what's called ring vaccination, where you vaccinate as part of the, the understanding of who are the close contacts. And so you limit the transmission and that helps you control the outbreak. And this was done with Ebola in, in the Congo um, just a, a short time ago, a couple of years ago. Um, but. But the main idea is the following. Most vaccinations that are new are used in this supplementary way. And, and what we need to do is to really grab hold of this and, and make a decision that we are not going to keep living with this virus. And, and realizing that even the controversy and the conflict that's happening in the country is, is not, it's not the main story here. People care about their families right. and their friends. And if we take the strong action, we can prevent our, the people that we care about right. from getting sick and from dying and, and recognizing that in communities, different communities can take ownership yeah. of the responsibility and to eliminate it. And it doesn't have to be the subject of a, of a national controversy yeah. because in communities we do care about each other. You know I wish we could continue with this conversation, but time has caught up with us. Thanks to all of you for being with us. That's it for this edition of The Heat. I'm Arnand Naidu in Washington, D.C. Thanks for watching. Hello everybody, I'm Arnand Naidu. If you enjoy the thoughtful, engaged discussions you see on The Heat, you may also want to subscribe to our podcast. It's appropriately titled The Heat. Twice a week we take a deep dive on world headlines, talking to experts, journalists and others. It's a fresh, focused and intimate look at the issues that matter most. Whether it's the Hong Kong riots, the latest Middle East conflict or US politics, The Heat podcast gives the clear context needed to understand both what's going on and why. And what's best, we come to you. Whether you're at home or on the go, you can find The Heat Podcast just about anywhere podcasts are found. Just search The Heat CGTN. Have a listen today and subscribe. Thanks.